In order to assure the success of their empire, a hegemon must apply to the composition of their populations this set of rules as much so as in order to assure the victory of their army, a strategist must apply to the composition of their armies the art of war. Just as by applying the art of war, one can win the game of risk and establish an empire, by applying these rules for the composition of their population, one who establishes or inherits such an empire can maintain their empire in safety. Section 2b2 The Maintenance of an Empire To maintain an empire, it is necessary to divide the population between a police force and the remainder of the population. The police force and the rest of the population are both comprised of slaves and citizens. Because it is necessary the perceived number of police be greater than the actual number of the rest of the population. In order to accomplish this, slaves in the police force are equal in rights to free citizens. Thus, citizen police are actually closer to the ruling elite than are the rest of the population. A citizen in the police force is defined by being a loyal volunteer, while a slave in the police force is defined as being an enemy conscript. The citizen-based police force is equivalent to an army of loyal volunteers. Just as a well-cared-for army of loyal volunteers is invincible in battle, the citizen-based police force is life or death in suppressing a revolt. In order to survive, it is necessary for the ruling elite or hegemon to establish a citizen-based police force greater in perceived number than the actual number of the non-police force population. Thus, well-taken-care-of slaves will side with the citizen-based police force, and so the perceived number of police will be greater than the actual number of citizens. In an empire under such conditions, whereby citizens who serve the role of police are well cared for, where citizens who do not serve the role of police are given less rights, and where well taken care of slaves are more likely to side with the police force than with their masters who are non-police free citizens, the ruling elite will prosper. In an empire under the conditions, however, whereby citizens who serve the role of police are not well cared for, where free citizens are perceived to outnumber the police force, or where slaves, well cared for or not, outnumber in actual number the perceived number of police, the ruling elite will be in peril. Section 2B2A Spies and Revolutions The citizen-based police force, given additional rights to free citizens, and well cared for, can be conscripted to serve the ruling elite in a capacity equivalent to that of an uncared for slave eager to betray their punitive master. This specialized role of the citizen police officer is that of the spy. The perceived number of spies is equal to the actual number of loyal volunteers to the citizen-based police force, even though not all loyal police are spies. This is, ultimately, the most important variable in the entire equation of empire. If the actual number of spies is less than or equal to the actual number of volunteer police, and the actual number of the ruling elite 
is less than the actual number of spies, the ruling elite will prosper most. However, if there is only a slight inequality in either of these cases, to imbalance the equation in the opposite direction, it will allow a successful revolt by the population against the ruling elite. If the actual number of spies were perceived to be less than the actual number of voluntary police, as it actually is, then the balance would be tipped in favor of the population. The slaves would revolt against their masters, the citizens against the police, the slave police against the free, and the free police against the spies, until the spies themselves would revolt against the ruling elite. Each of these naturally outnumbers the next, such that eventually the entire population would side against the ruling elite. The form of revolt in which the entire population sides against the ruling elite is called a revolution. When one ruling elite is overthrown in a successful revolution, a larger actual number ruling elite establishes a new empire. Because the entire mechanism of empire hinges on the single gear defined as the perceived number of spies being greater than or equal to the actual number of free police, it is also this linchpin that must be studied to achieve a successful revolution. Section 2 B. 2. B. Secret Police There are two types of police. Free police, who are loyal volunteers, and slave police, who are drafted conscripts. The actual number of spies is comprised of a fraction of the free police and a fraction of the slave police as well. This is how the perceived number of spies may be maintained as greater than the actual number, and thus how the perceived number of the ruling elite, comprised of the actual number of the ruling elite and the spies, can be maintained as greater than the actual number of the ruling elite, comprised of the actual number of ruling elite and the fraction of spies drawn from the free police. The difference is the actual number of slave police who are spies. If the slave spies side with the citizens, a revolt will be successful. If the slave spies side with the elite, no revolt can succeed. Because of this, for an empire to be maintained, there must be more spies drawn from free police than from slave police. For a conscripted police officer to be made a spy, they must be promised freedom. For a volunteer police officer to be made a spy, they must be promised expanded personal rights. The scale of rights in an empire is therefore opposite the three-tiered triangle designed for the population. The greatest actual number group, slaves, have the least rights, while the smallest perceived number group, the ruling elite, have the most rights. The second greatest actual number group, citizens, have less rights than police, who have less rights than spies, who serve the ruling elite directly. Police have the medium amount of rights, and comprise the medium actual number sized group. This is why spies should come from the free police above the slaves, and why police should come from voluntary free citizens more so than from slaves. If police desire freedom, it is dangerous to the empire. Therefore, the police force is the exact opposite of an army. The army that fights best fights to expand the rights of their own nation. The police force that serves best uses brute force to limit the rights of its nation's citizens. 
Thus citizens are made the slaves of the police, police the servants of spies, and spies the actual rulers behind a hegemon. This will only appear complex to the common citizen due to the manipulation of their perception by spies. They have been convinced that there are no slaves because we are all equally capable of earning money. They have been convinced that having money will give them rights expanded as much as those of the police. They have been convinced that spies and police serve the best interests of the population. Most insidiously, they have been convinced they do not even presently live in an empire. Section 2C The Current Empire An empire is defined by a strong police force, a weak population, a high perceived number of spies, and small actual number ruling elite, as well as a weak or absent army defending the personal rights of their nation's own citizens. However, there exists no industrial nation at this time that does not fit this definition. In fact, it is widely accepted by the citizens of all nations that the art of war was long ago applied to the game of risk and that the current ruling elite are comprised of traitors to the populations of their own nations who rule internationally now. These elite are simply called the rich, while the population of their empire are collectively known, relative to their rulers, as the poor. This is because the strategy of money has been victorious over the brute force of armies and police. Because the elite, through spies, claim to have almost all of the money, the remainder of the populations of all nations are made to desire and to serve that money. They are told that money means survival and that work brings freedom, but such concepts are contradictions and impossibilities of fiction. Therefore, although we are told by spies who serve the elite that we live in nations and that the armies of those nations are at war with one another. The majority of the population realizes that we are all united in poverty caused by the rumors of such international wars, but that, because no nations exist, no wars between them are possible. Instead, we understand war as the elite sending two groups of the population to kill one another. Therefore, where there are no nations, no wars, and no wealth, there is revealed only the true conditions of our present reality. The ruling elite, their spies, and the police who oppress money slaves. All serve to gain the promise of wealth, which they themselves will never actually possess. Until the population of citizens realizes that, relative to police, they have the same rights as slaves do relative to citizens, there will not be a revolution. Just as slaves fear free citizens, the citizens who fear the police will remain slaves to their own luxury. So long as citizens fear police, Police enjoy expanded rights to those of citizens. So long as this continues to be the case, the current empire will persist.